the mobile internet and the social web. And the first graph on the left there shows, um, and basically I'm dating the smartphone. There are different definitions of what a smartphone is as something that can do run independent apps, had a 3G connection, and an advanced user interface, which remarkably is only two years ago. Um, and that's the Apple iPhone 3G. You have Android a little later that year coming into the market. And this growth, at, at, for the last two, I don't have the Android um, data points to add, but they're big. So you might be getting up to a base of close to 100 million devices now. Um, the rate of growth may be getting close to maybe 100 million a year. It's hard to tell. It's, it's changing so fast. So if you take the developed world to be about a billion people, it, it's moving very quickly in terms of the, the penetration of these smartphones. And, and they enable all sorts of things, including price comparison when you're out and about, scanning a barcode and doing a search based on that, making a purchase, potentially in future making the payment using the device. Um, so we think that's important, and, and no one quite knows what that will do, but it will do something. And on the right-hand side, we just have this indicator, which I think will be clear enough to everybody, that um, the social web is also important. And as Stephen said, may not be fully exploited yet in terms of the opportunities to use that information, but the information set is large, and I'm sure people will find ways to use it. And again, the UK is, is fairly prominent in terms of the take-up of that, and, and on the smartphone case, those are global numbers, but the UK is a significant market. Um, so it, it is a dynamic marketplace, and there are disruptive changes happening <coughs> now, which will continue to, to run for, well, the next five to ten years, and there may be other things that we haven't thought of that will happen. Um, Stephen has talked about the kind of reality, what we observe in the marketplace and what we find when we talk to people. This is a, a few reflections here on the economic analysis that needs to reflect that reality. And it's, it's actually quite tough applying economics to, to dynamic problems. You can't just draw supply and demand curves and make inferences the way one might like to. It's, it's more complicated. Um, Clearly there are network effects for some of these platforms that can lead to concentration, although as we've said, uh, well, one point of that is successful firms may make high returns, um, although many fail on the way. So whether those high returns are what one might term excessive is, is I think open to debate. I mean, there is a, there is a prize for successful firms here who, who innovate. Um, but what we see is there is pressure for, for firms that may have a strong position in the market to continue to innovate and serve their customers because they're continually faced with this threat of some other innovation starting to eat away at their market or displace them. And um, that threat is, is ongoing, which seems to promote good conduct in these markets. Um, why are we getting this move towards open platforms? And I think that is fascinating. It's not necessarily uh, coming from a telecoms background what one would necessarily expect. The, the normal assumption is that if firms are vertically integrated and have strong platforms that they might um, exclude competitors. And we see encouragement of openness here. Um, I think it's partly because in this environment you're working with these standard interfaces. So the costs of connecting with third party services are low. It's the way the software is developed. You can kind of put it together like Lego. Um, so the costs of doing it are low, but also because you have this ability to exploit a very heterogeneous customer base um, and to target particular segments, firms know that they can't do it all themselves. And that, I guess, is the Apple rationale for opening the App Store to third parties. There are very few Apple apps, actually, like maybe 10 or so in the store and the other few hundred thousand by third parties. It's because you'll never have all the ideas yourself, so you might as well open it up and exploit that. Um, so that's interesting and, and a, a positive thing, I think. These markets are information intensive, and that seems to be, um, that, that tendency is going to get stronger with the exploitation of data on social platforms. Uh, and certainly the exploitation of some of the data that's collect collected when you use a mobile device, location and so on. Um, that has a, a positive side in the sense that purchase recommendations can be tailored to the customer, that search is more meaningful and so on. Um, but it's also true that firms may use 
this information to price discriminate and potentially to extract surplus. And as you'll know, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it may lead to uh, complaints. Uh, people may see that as unfair or, or problematic. Um, and I think what you see at the moment is, is a lot of a kind of contest over who can capture the rents in the value chain. Who gets to do this? Who gets to, to take the surplus? Um, transparency. Well, there's a lot more information that's available to consumers, and so they can be more discriminating in their purchase decisions, and that may, in some instances, promote competition. You may be able to make comparisons and um, exploit that opportunity that wouldn't have been available before. And, and certainly, for example, you can compare prices of different countries, you can compare prices online and offline from different suppliers and make a decision. Um, almost a counterpoint to what I said about uh, <clears throat> price differentiation and rents is the fact that auctions have been very successful in, in some formats and uh, they are inherently not about um, the supplier setting discriminatory terms, they're about people who want to use the platform nominating their price. So uh, I think there it's the extremely low transaction costs of running auctions means that that format is used for some things, AdWords for example. Um, we mentioned this point before about buyer and seller reputations. One of the issues there is that those are non-transferable, generally. Um, so if you build up a reputation as a seller on eBay, you won't be able to take that to another platform readily. You, know, you have to use other mechanisms to rebuild your reputation. So um, there are quite a few issues about the transfer of information and reputations. And this last point in relation to um, supplier restrictions in particular, but possibly other conduct is that if you have transparency that can be a good thing but it also means that um, players in the market can discipline conduct that they don't like which may or may not be good um, so transparency is kind of two-edged sword here and we thought we would end you'll have your own questions potentially but just to raise some questions that arise from this work um, the first one is, is kind of what are the relevant markets and how might they change? You know, it's quite difficult to hear to say what is the market. And search is an obvious example that um, Stephen set out how other activities are starting to impinge on that space that search has had to itself to some extent. So um, it's fluid. And, and how will the social web change the relevant markets? How will the mobile internet change the relevant markets? And something else we mentioned is that this is different it, for different activities. If you're selling books versus vacuum cleaner bags versus something else, um, the relevant market may be quite different in terms of the, the gateways to get to market. What is the impact of the blurring of this online, offline boundary? And I think this will have quite profound implications. Um, what's, what's the impact on competition? We've mentioned that it may stimulate uh, competition for delivery of goods. Um, and on incentives for vertical restraints. I mean, if one of the arguments for vertical restraints is to avoid a free rider problem whereby somebody um, uses the expertise in store and then just makes a purchase at the cheapest available supplier offline. Um, I think increasingly that can go the other way as well. That many of the online platforms are information rich. They have reviews, they have um, user ratings. You might then opportunistically, in a way, make the purchase at a bricks and mortar store. So I, I don't think it's a one-way traffic in terms of thinking about that problem. So uh, if one looks at the literature on vertical restraints, I don't think it's fully taken account of that. You'd have to kind of rework the incentives for vertical restraints and what the welfare implications were taking account of this blurring of the boundary. Um, what are the implications of the growth in information um, for switching behavior, this, this movement of reputation? in all sorts of ways. I mean, we're, we're accustomed to thinking of things like moving your telephone number, for example, but this is a whole different world where you might want to move your Facebook profile somewhere else, you might want to move a reputation from eBay somewhere else. Can you do that? And there are some initiatives to make that easier, so you know, the private sector is doing something like that. Um, for price dis discrimination online and potentially offline, and I could imagine a possibility, I mean, this is been a bit futuristic where you might have a situation where the, even in stores, in bricks and mortar stores, the prices were personalised to you. Um, perhaps because you've got a smartphone, you scan a barcode and it gives you
fewer price. Now, clearly the ability to do that can be undermined by arbitrage, but you could imagine a possibility where that happened or where the in-store camera recognised you as someone who'd been there before. It knew who you were, therefore it um, you know, changed the terms of trade depending on that, who that individual is. So I think that could move from being just an online phenomenon to being an offline phenomenon. In a sense, moving back to the world of not having um, posted prices anymore, which is the way it was centuries ago. Um, we will stop there and open it up to questions. And there is a, a mic here if people want to use that.